day for the trust. It's a historic day, and it's my privilege to be the master of ceremonies today. Before inviting our first speaker forward, can I first acknowledge uh, representatives of the Tribal Council of Te Runanga and Aronai Tahu. So, um, we will we're also especially welcome Edward Allison from Naitahu. Edward has been a long time friend of the Trust, has served on the board for uh, quite an extended period and has given us the benefit of his wisdom over the years. Our first speaker today is uh, James Gould. Now James is a commenter in his own right. Uh, I think it was 28 years ago that he made the decision to put uh, 100 hectares of high peak station in Covenant. Now James is going to have the distinction of talking about this lovely government proposal that we're talking about today. James. Honourable Dr Nick Smith, distinguished guests, National Trust directors and staff, Covenanters. This is a milestone day for the Queen of the Second National Trust and for our new covenanting partner, Soho Properties Limited. It marks the biggest ever proposal to come before the National Trust in its 37 year history. And because of the nature and terms which have been agreed to, it will be, in effect, New Zealand's first privately owned national park, open for the public to enjoy. It has come about through the vision and extraordinary philanthropy of one man and his representatives here in New Zealand but it has also involved a number of other agencies who all worked together to bring to fruition a new concept in private public conservation partnerships. And I'd like to acknowledge the support and the help of our partners who've embraced the challenge and worked hard to get us to this point. First, none of this would have happened if Russell Hamilton, acting on directions from Mutt Lang, had not approached the Trust in September last year seeking covenants over the four properties of Mount Soho Station, Motatapu Station, Genko Station and Coroner Peak Station. Russell and his directors and legal advisors led by Willie Sussman have all applied huge resources to get us to this point and the Trust has welcomed their positive approach to finding solutions to the problems that inevitably crop up during these processes. We are grateful to the Commissioner of Crown Lands and to the Chief Executive of Land Information New Zealand for their help in expediting what could have been a protracted process. Similarly, the Department of Conservation has been highly supportive and both the Minister and Director, Director General have been involved since the beginning, while the local expertise of Barry Hanson and Greg Lind and their teams have been invaluable. And Minister, I'd like to acknowledge the extra effort you went to in getting us additional funding uh, for the National Trust this year. It's, it's been a great support to us. Thank you. The Walking Access Commission has assumed the lead role in formalising the track systems and will continue to manage this along with assistance from DOC, the Queenstown Lakes District Council and the Queenstown Trails Trust. No doubt as the network of facilities for public usage grows, we can expect the involvement of other agencies and organisations. And so our property have already had well established relationships with Naitaru and Heritage New Zealand. The Central Lakes Trust has made a generous donation to the National Trust to support survey work and Steel and Tube have come to the party as long-term partners for both Soho and the National Trust. And I'll leave it to Brett Douglas to announce the details of the sponsorship shortly. Finally, I must thank the Trust Chief Executive, Mike Jepson, and all the regional and head office staff who've worked overtime to bring the biggest ever and the most complicated covenant proposal to the board for approval in record time. In summary, this has been a multi-agency, for want of a better expression, exercise with a multiple win outcome, and my thanks go to all those involved. Obviously, the act of covenanting 53,000 hectares of visually stunning Otago landscape, which we can see beside us, is newsworthy in itself. But it's important to recognise the incredible suite of values that will be now protected in perpetuity as a gift to the nation. The four covenants will cover 95% of the land area of the four stations and will protect native habitat, rare and endangered species, water catchments and cultural and geological and archaeological sites on private land 
while at the same time allowing for public access and recreation. The covenants protect montane and alpine tussock lands, cushion fields, tarns, wetlands, gorges and shrublands, forest remnants, rocky outcrops and rare and endangered plants and animals, all in a spectacular environment rich in history ranging from Naihatahu habitation, gold mining including early Chinese settlement and historic back trails through to extensive pastoral farming. Recreational uses will include short walks and tramping, mountain biking, horse trekking, four-wheel drive trips, hunting, rock climbing and ski touring, all in close proximity to New Zealand's, New Zealand's premier tourist destination. It's important to recognise the scale of this protected landscape in a national context. The Soho Properties Limited Covenants are about the same size as the combined area of two of our national parks, Paparoa and Abel Tasman. Or to put it in another context, these covenants cover a land area the equivalent of 90% of Greater Auckland City. When added to the National Trust's existing covenanted area, the Trust now protects more than 170,000 hectares about the same size as Stewart Island, Rakiora, throughout New Zealand's 70% of land that's in private ownership. The Soho Properties Covenants demonstrate on a truly grand scale what is happening at a more moderate rate on private land on a voluntary basis every week. Landowners, mainly farmers, are queuing up to partner with the National Trust to provide enduring protection over those parts of their properties that they consider have special natural, historical, cultural values. And often because this takes place on the country's most modified landscapes, the protection extends to rare, endangered and underrepresented species. The landowner undertakes to maintain the covenant, including weeds and pests and fencing maintenance, in effect acting as a resident caretaker for the duration of their ownership. Those acts of selfless altruism may not have the public impact that today's announcement does, but each covenant is a unique demonstration of ordinary people doing extraordinary things in the national interest. In Soho's case, the efforts expended to date in eliminating pests such as goats and possums and mustelids and attacking weeds such as wilding trees, revegetation programs and habitat restoration, new infrastructure has been an immense investment in restoring this land to good health. On average, the National Trust completes two or three covenants agreements every week. And by the end of this year, we expect that we will register our 4,000th covenant. Each one of those covenants is an enduring legacy to a landowner's desire to ensure a special part of New Zealand is protected in perpetuity. That mosaic of precious places has today been hugely enhanced by a committed environmentalist making an extraordinary request to the country, one he doesn't even live in. The National Trust has a huge responsibility to ensure that this vision and his philanthropy is enhanced through our role as perpetual trustee. We're up for the challenge, and we look forward to our partnership with Soho Properties to bring these covenants to full registration in a few months. Thank you. Now, at the Trust, we always think our most important partner is the landholder who's taking on the commitment with the Trust to manage this land in perpetuity. We've got two speakers today that are speaking on behalf of the landowner. The first speaker is Russell Hamilton, who's been charged with delivering on the vision of the owner in terms of what he wants to do with the property. Willie Sussman is also here, who's worked with the owner for over, I think, 10 years, uh, and he's it's unusual, mainly when we work with lawyers uh, on landowners, that they're often looking to weaken covenants, you know, because they're always looking to ensure that you know, all their clients' interests are looked after. We're in the fortunate position that we've got a landowner very committed to protection, and so if anything, Willie's been helping us to strengthen the covenant, which is a great outcome. So without further ado, I'll ask Russell and Willie to talk on behalf of the owner. And all the same today. 
On Mark's behalf, I'd like to thank you for your attendance and support. It's unfortunate that fresh of the business is prevented from coming today because it would have been really good to have him here uh, for, to be involved in this as well. But unfortunately, he can't make it. I know he's very appreciative of the fact he was able to produce, uh, to purchase the leases of the properties in such a beautiful area. And he, I know he feels privileged to be the custodian of it's regrettable he's unable to attend, spend more time here on the property, but he's constantly in touch and he's very aware and involved in all aspects of activities on the property. And he's, he's actually very astute at working out what's going on. He's got a very good handle of things. He came in with a, a lot of experience, but uh, he certainly picked up on where the, where the important issues are. A covenant guaranteeing the protection of the area is something that we've always had in mind, and Mutt is most enthusiastic about our partnership with the QE2 Trust. He's most appreciative uh, of, the, of the contribution of the various parties today, because there are a lot of parties um, who've helped immensely with this process. First, my initial involvement with the Soho property began when I was approached by Bryce Jack to assist with obtaining um, an OIO consent to purchase. Uh, Matatahu and Soho stations. And uh, that was an interesting mission, but we, we eventually worked our way through that and uh, consent was approved, at which time Matt asked me to supervise the properties. I must admit I was a bit, of, uh, a bit reluctant at the time, but agreed to do it for three years. <laughs> it was not long before I realised the calibre of who I was dealing with, and the scale of his vision, and needless to say, that's why I'm still fully committed after ten years. It, it's certainly an important uh, thing, and, it's, and I personally see it as a real privilege to be involved. Over the past years, we've concentrated on uh, improving the lower country, and this has enabled us to exclude stock from virtually all the riparian areas, wetlands, high tusk bands, and the high tops. The withdrawal of stock from these areas has resulted in substantial natural regeneration of the native flora, along with our pro uh, uh, planting program. And the result has been a much improved bird habitat. Um, the improved habitat, coupled with a robust predator control program, has already really resulted in a, a noticeable increase in the bird numbers. It's only a start, but we, we feel that we are making process, progress. Apart from the obvious measure of having a healthy bird, bird population, we think that the birds are of huge, a huge importance uh, going forward, you know, given so many of our plant species rely on, on birds to distribute seeds. So without uh, a healthy bird population, I think that we, we struggle to have a healthy forest. We're also currently engaged with Naitahu and Doc in a joint venture to reintroduce Bafweka into the area. We're three years down the track on that. And uh, that's, we're pretty hard that's going pretty well. Uh, we're not at the stage where we can release them, but we're, we've got birds uh, breeding successfully on the place. And uh, hopefully in the next year or two, we, we, we'll see a release of Weka back on the mainland. And that we'll see um, this expanded to uh, include other species. You know, see other species introduced as well, or reintroduced. Public access is also something, also something Mark has been keen to encourage, and we're working with walking access to establish a number of walking tracks. There has also been a significant investment committed to the farmed area, not under covenant, and that farm is, is now actually performing quite well. Uh, people should be aware that uh, the farmed area will not be open to the public. Uh, 
that's excluding the day that we have the Matatapu race um, that's run by the, the Queenstown Trails Trust. So every year there's an annual event that goes through the valley. I'm sure there's quite a few here that are involved and it seems quite very popular. Parts of this area are very familiar to a lot of people. Um, you know, the Arrow River, from up to Maystown, to, uh, up to Maystown. and uh, Skippers, a lot of people go to Skippers and on up to the branches. Um, it's got a lot of history and it's, it's very popular with the public today. The history goes back to the mining area, era and on and beyond prior to human occupation when it was integral, an integral part of uh, the tribal territory and subject to regular birding and, and uh, healing expeditions. Last week, um, I had a meeting with Edward Ellison and, and some of his members from the Laitahu. And Edward recounted the story of an, of an ancestor of his, Matt's, Rania Era Ellison. Now, Trish said I would never be able to pronounce that. <laughs> I've made an honest attempt. Um, now, he was credited with um, finding gold at Mary Point, and which resulted in, the, in, the, in a major gold rush in the upper Shire. Um, Ed was just explaining he, he also, uh, their party got low on food at one stage, and, and he was. Um, he swam in the, a flooded show of a river and caught some wetter on the other side, so they were wetter there at that time, and uh, kept, the, kept the party alive. And uh, you know, when I was travelling home that night, I couldn't help but think uh, about the degree of change that uh, Rainier uh, era would, would um, had seen in his lifetime. You know, the area was, would go from what was a very tranquil um, location with a lot of bird life, periodic visits by the Naitahu tribe, to the mayhem of the gold rush, uh, and being invaded by hordes of miners uh, during that period. Mary Point alone was reputed to have had up to 2,000 miners active at the peak of the rush. He would have seen the, the country literally ripped apart. Um, you know, the first rush, alluvial miners were working in, in basically the, in getting alluvial gold. Then they were followed by uh, huge sluicing operations, uh, dredges working in the river, and then the reef mining with batteries. It would have been uh, chaotic. Uh, the birds would have been gone uh, in, in very short term time. The, uh, the, the change would have been quite dramatic. And I, I'm sure he couldn't ever have imagined what the end result would be. Um, I think viewed from a Maori perspective, the impact of the discovery would be there was nothing short of catastrophic. Gold mining era, the gold mining era actually contributed hugely to the wealth and development of New Zealand, and particularly in Otago, Benin, Benefit, and uh, also with the influx of new settlers that came to the gold rush and stayed, it gave um, uh, New Zealand as we know it now a huge boost in, 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 in a direction, but I don't think we should ever Forget that the, the, there was some cost, and there was definitely a cost to the environment. Erosion from the shot over um, has certainly been a major uh, cause of erosion in the, in the Tootha River in Catherine. Um, you only have to look at the Roxford Dam and, and the um, Clyde Dam, Lake Dunstan, the, uh, the backburn arm of Lake Dun Dunstan's filling up as we speak. To be aware of the way it's going, we can't 
um, reduce some of these problems. We've a lot of this problem has been compounded with um, rabbit invasion of rabbits, deer, um, goats have been a real problem. So we've we've um, you know we're seeing a landscape that's changed dramatically, and the and the um, the impact is something that we hopefully will see reversed by what we're trying to do with this covenant. This covenant is going to protect the land going forward. The soil and water values will benefit from it. There's no doubt about that, in my view. And hopefully we'll see a, the beginning of a healing process. That's, that's probably, in fairness, it's probably occurring now, but it might accelerate and ensure that the, the healing process does occur. To date, we've made small, small steps in the right direction. I think Mother Nature is a lot more resilient than most people give her credit for. And given a chance, um, restoration is possible. I would like to think that if uh, Raniera Allison were able to be here today, he might get the nod of approval. Thank you. shun the limelight as he does. 
but he's an exceptionally private person. It would be nice to it would be nice to find some way of for New Zealand to recognise even uh, might, even if only to encourage others to follow in his footsteps. It continues to be a privilege to work with Mutt and Russell and share in a small way in the vision for a better tomorrow. Thank you. Our next speaker needs very little uh, introduction. You know, he's had some of the most challenging portfolios of the year and some of the most important to the country in terms of conservation and environment. Uh, the Minister of Conservation is also the Minister responsible for the Queen Elizabeth the Second National Trust and we value greatly his support for the Trust work. So Minister, the Honourable Nick Smith, please come forward. And can I acknowledge in essence uh, Mark Lange, who through this incredible act of generosity has enabled us to come together and celebrate conservation uh, and generosity of spirit uh, in an incredible way and take up your challenge, uh, Willie, of making sure that New Zealand appropriately in good time acknowledges this extraordinary act of conservation gaining. Uh, can I acknowledge uh, James Gill uh, and the trustees of QE2, um, uh, Russell uh, as the farm manager and agent uh, here in New Zealand, uh, Ed Wilson and the team from uh, Naitahu Bauri and the team um, from DOG. It's an incredible privilege to be part of this formal announcement. I can get all excited when QE2 presents me with 30 hectare covenants on special parts of New Zealand. I worked out that if my speech time was going to be proportionate, you'd be here for about a month. <laughs> and I won't make you suffer for that long. But such is the extraordinality of the scale of 53,000 hectares of land. But actually, even more than that, if you were asked to identify some of the extraordinarily special places of New Zealand, Arrowtown and Wanaka and this area of the central Otago would be right up there. And for us as a country to be able to secure a conservation covenant over not just an incredible area in terms of landscape but in size is what makes today uh, that very, very uh, special occasion. It's important uh, to acknowledge the work that the QE2 Covenant and the concept has had since James, the organisation was established 37 years ago. I wonder if those founders from the conservation movement and the farming community who had a vision of farming and conservation being able to make gains for New Zealand's nature would ever have dreamed an event of this size and scale uh, coming from the establishment of the New Zealand's uh, Q2 Trust. I also uh, want to say this announcement is absolutely consistent with the government's new direction for DOC to try and get Kiwis, including, and I'm going to describe Mark as an honorary Kiwi, because uh, he certainly more than earned that, is to get Kiwis to understand what probably Naitabu Edward has always understood, and that is that the huge natural treasures that we are blessed with in New Zealand, and the responsibility that's not just dogs, but all of us, if we are to pass on the places and species that are special to these lands uh, to our grandchildren and their grandchildren. Uh, it was a bit of a tussle at budget time because we are a bit squeezed, I think, the local member Bill English's budget surpluses was wafer thin, he's going to announce it next week, I think we're now calling it tissue thin, <laughs> uh, but despite that, managed to still find uh, an increase in QE2's budget from 3.2 to 4.2 million dollars this year, in recognition that the government actually sees this role of conservation in future is going to be far more about the sorts of valuable partnerships uh, that we are acknowledging and celebrating today.
And my last point is a little tiny bit political. You'll excuse me. Just the season. <laughs> but there's been a huge debate raging over the last five days around New Zealand taking a closed-door exclusion approach that we don't want no foreigners here. We certainly don't want them buying our funds. I say to people, actually, open your eyes. There are incredibly generous, well-motivated, good people that want to be part of the New Zealand story. And we need not be fearful of that. That, no, we shouldn't. We should be rightly saying that where our farms are to be purchased by overseas people, we want to see some benefit for New Zealand. But for those that deny there is any benefit, I'm sorry, today's announcement blows any such criticism completely out of the water. I just want to again say thanks to Russell, to Soho, and most particularly uh, to Mark, to all those that have been of part of this vision for an extraordinary area of landscape uh, and biodiversity value that has been protected for future generations. Today is a really good day for conservation and for the future trust. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, one of the key components of the vision for this property is the vision for access for members of the public to get to parts of the property that they never would have got to before. So we've asked um, John Forbes, who's the chairman of the New Zealand Walking Access Commission, who's working in partnership with Soho, ourselves, the Department of Conservation, to say a few words about that. John. Can I firstly acknowledge my uh, tahu in the Mana Funeral place and um, thank you for your welcome. Uh, Minister, it must be a very pleasant day for you, I'm sure. And also acknowledge Soho Properties and uh, the incredible generosity that's, that's um, bringing about this community. The Criminals with the Second National Trust, whose capacity and uh, resources are enabling it to take place. We have Vanessa in the um, Queenstown. District Council, and I think a representative here also from Central Lake Targo, uh, Department of Conservation, and um, others that are here. Please, thank you. It's great to be in this beautiful part of New Zealand speaking about a proposal that has the potential to open up opportunities for conservation and recreation. Today's event is an important milestone in that process that's already involved a collaborative and cooperative effort between many different parties. I want to particularly acknowledge Soho Properties, which have, um, in, a, in a very magnanimous gesture, voluntarily agreed to covenant large areas of Connie, Vic, Green Coke, Motor Tapu, and Mount Soho stations, and the, and the um, National Trust for uh, uh, the leadership role they've taken in enabling the covenant to happen. The New Zealand Walking Access Commission's role in this project is to work with the Commissioner of Crown Lands to formalise the new walkways that have been proposed as part of the process. Significant work has been done over the past three years to investigate the best means of establishing these walkways and to consider and approach organisations that might become controlling authorities. On this point, I'm very pleased to say that the National Trust has offered to be a controlling authority for the walkways. The Commission welcomes that offer and warmly accepts it. While there is still some way to go, we are working with the Commissioner of Crown Lands to develop the walkway easements under the Walking Access Act on Coronet and Glencoe stations. Some of these easements are being created to meet the, the purchase conditions set by the Overseas Investment Office, but that isn't the case for all of them. In addition to the walkways established under the OIO provisions, Soho Properties has shown great generosity by offering to open formal walkways over Coronet Peak and Glencoe. This is a magnificent gesture and it is intended to secure access and perpetuity for New Zealanders and overseas visitors. Enjoyment of the outdoors is part of what it is to be a New Zealander. New access that will be created as this proposal comes to fruition will help to enhance and keep our access culture and heritage alive. 
the value of that x is being created by this process is greater than the sum of its parts. All of the walkways are within easy reach of Queenstown, providing opportunities for adventure, recreation, and an appreciation of the area's rich history, scenery, and culture. These backcountry trails in New Zealand, and New Zealand's outstanding high country, also complement the extensive range of established trails developed by the Wak in the Wakatipu Basin by community groups in the Queenstown Lakes District Council. While these new walkways would be freely accessible to all, they may also offer opportunities for tourism. They have the potential to attract visitors who wish to explore and enjoy the area. Spending money on accommodation, the region's stunning food and wine, and outdoor gear, walking, uh, guiding services, etc. The people of this region have plenty of reason to be excited about the potential of these trails. There is still some way to go to make them a reality track record and goodwill of the many parties involved makes me optimistic about the future. Some of the challenges are in detail. Many of the proposed trails on Coronet Peak and Glencoe stations cross unformed eagle roads, marginal strips, conservation land and as well as private land. Track use, formation and management is subject to a range of legal, environmental and heritage considerations. Legal processes must be accurate and thorough, comply with a range of legislation and provide for sensible and practical outcomes. On behalf of the New Zealand Walking Access Commission, I again acknowledge the generosity of Soho Properties and congratulate all the parties on the achievement we recognise here today. Thank you. Thank you, John. We, we have a saying in Kerry too that good fences make good covenants. Um, we're extremely fortunate in this case that virtually all the fencing uh, has been done by the owner themselves because it would have been an incredibly daunting task if we'd been offered to fund 50% of the fencing on this property, which is what we do with most of our common tools. Um, in recognition of that, we've been working uh, with Steel and Chew both in relation to this property and, and we're forming a partnership with them in terms of fencing support for all our covenanters. So I'd like to uh, invite Brett, Doug, Brett Douglas, the GM Marketing for Steel and Chew, to just say a few words about this event. Uh, Honourable Dr Smith, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today and to be part of uh, what is clearly an important and iconic project. At first glance, you may be forgiven for thinking the partnership between a steel distribution company and an organisation whose role is to promote, preserve and enhance the open spaces is a bit of an odd coupling. But in practice and reality, it's a perfect fit and it's one that we are, as Steel and Tube are very proud to be part of. Although, in essence, our core business lies in distribution, our range of products and services are used extensively in landmark projects that support and sustain New Zealand's economic growth and prosperity across engineering, manufacturing, construction, infrastructure, and, of course, the rural sectors. It's fair to say that, as a company, uh, we tend to maintain a low-key role in these landmark projects. Uh, preferring instead uh, that our customers take the central stage. It means that in many ways, um, and there may be those who um, disagree, Steel and Tube remains one of New Zealand's hidden success stories. However, our connection with the rural sector has always been of particular importance to us. And in this year, when our company celebrates 60 years of business, we are proud to be able to boast of strong, long-lasting partnerships among farmers, rural manufacturers, dairy cooperatives, and rural merchants. Uh, we've long been enthusiastic supporters of and participants in key field days on the rural calendar, and we're gold sponsors of the Fencing Contractors Association in New Zealand. It was, in fact, our fencing product line uh, which uh, first connected us, so to speak, with the QE2 Trust in February this year. When we, um, when we first commenced dialogue. The idea of a partnership with, with the Trust grew from this. 
by supplying wire fencing manufactured and marketed under our 80-year-old Hurricane brand. Uh, Steel and Chew uh, has, an, uh, has an excellent opportunity uh, to contribute and support to the important work uh, that the Trust does in protecting New Zealand's heritage and the role of farmers as responsible land stewards. So in short, um, it's not such an odd coupling after all. On the contrary, uh, we as Steel and Chew look forward to a strong and mutually rewarding relationship with the Trust. It is certainly pleasing to note the number of covenants that have been growing steadily over the last 20 years. And as marketing manager, I, I like statistics and uh, have, have uh, read them very carefully. And certainly Steel and Tube looks forward to making our contribution uh, to an important, or this important and continually evolving area of conservation. Thank you. It's a little known fact that um, for the average covenant, 40% of the trust's cost in establishing a covenant is support, matching the landowner's support to fence the covenants. So that's why a partnership with Hurricane and Steel and Chew is a real coup for the Kiritu National Trust. Now I will just ask James to come forward and say a few final words before Naitahu closes the event. Thanks, Mark. Um, shortly I'll ask Edward Ellison to close uh, today's events. Um, Minister Smith in his address questioned whether those early pioneering farmers who set up the QE2 National Trust 40 years ago and lobbied the government to get a, an act of parliament to carry through how they would have felt about this. Luckily, we are in a position to be able to tell you how one of them does feel about it. Um, a man who probably we owe more to in, in respect of the trust and its origins is Gordon Stevenson. Gordon Stevenson is still living on his farm in the Waikato of the Black Sea and he was a, a major force in driving the creation of the Q2 National Trust. He, um, as, as I say, is still living there uh, and in, a, in a, an extraordinary sort of serendipitous coincidence, yesterday the Trust Board approved an additional uh, add-on and, a, and a, a, another plot added on to Covenant Number 1, which is registered on Gordon's property. Uh, so, and Gordon, when he heard of what Matt Lang had done in bringing this into the, uh, the a very large addition to the mosaic of trust properties around the country, wrote a letter, and with his permission, I will read it to you. Find my glasses. He, um, he writes, Dear Mr. Lang, I stand in awe at your commitment. It's been a privilege for me to watch the germ of an idea born some 40 years ago while sitting in front of a farmhouse fire grow into thousands of farmers covenanting hundreds of thousands of hectares of their properties to protect them in perpetuity. In spite of this quite remarkable achievement by those landowners, there was always just something missing from the completion of the dream. This was the covenanting of an entire landscape. Your selfless action completes that dream. You make one somewhat elderly gentleman very happy indeed. I'm sure you'll never regret your actions. One strength of the covenanting process is that these agreements are entered into without the inducements of grants or compensation, with no pressures to sign but simply because of a conviction that it's the right thing to do. The other strength is that we end up with every one of these treasured plots having its own guardian or ranger. This is true kaitiakatanga in action. And for those entering into a covenant, there is the additional comfort of knowing that a, the trust is held, is held in trust and perpetuity. Mr. Lang, you have set an exemplary model that may guide others seeking to enter large-scale whole farm covenants. Congratulations and thank you. Sign Gordon Stevenson. And I now ask Edward Ellison, former trust member, 
and representing the local Rapatu Rinaga to close today's proceedings. Dr. Smith, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Soho Station, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and take part in this, this uh, significant announcement. I just want to briefly you know, pick up on a theme that Russell was uh, deploying in his uh, speech to us and about my great grandfather, Rainier Ellison. Uh, just by coincidence, last night uh, at dinner with my colleagues, we were talking about who would be the deceased New Zealand you would most like to meet if you ever had that opportunity? By coincidence, mine was Rani Edihana or Ellison, because he lived through that time. There were so many changes. So that is uh, uncanny. However, when we were talking about New Zealanders or honorary New Zealanders living, who we'd like to meet, because New Zealand is such a small country, we couldn't think of anyone because we met. Most of the people. I now realise that Mark Lane is probably that person. The extraordinary gift that he is making to this nation, the example and the vision, I think, is just superlative. So, now we have to gear you. We, Maito, um, would like to acknowledge uh, Mark Lane and through his uh, manager, Russell Hamilton positive contribution they are making to protecting and maintaining the biodiversity values of the four stations now and for future generations. It is a significant example on a national scale of a landholder working in partnership with Kiwi 2 and other parties to make such a positive con contribution to our national heritage possible. We acknowledge the importance of the uh, Minister of Conservation's increase in budget for QE2. The, the, the importance of that is traits like the like. And so landholders are able to expand and create special areas for protection on private and, in this case, leasehold lands. Now we have to get the Minister. It is extremely important for NATO that open space covenanting incorporates and reflects our indigenous cultural values. Therefore, we are doubly pleased to be a part of and support this significant announcement that the landholder and QE2 National Trust are working together to develop covenants over 53,000 hectares of the Soho properties. We as NAITA who have Kautiaki obligations for all our time, supporting Kautiaki relationships will harness NAITA knowledge, resource and value that we think will strengthen conservation of the precious habitats and species. The exercise of Kaitiaki Tonga encompasses all of our cultural dimensions, including creation traditions, relationships with the whenua, our whakapapa, right through to the rules that govern our mahi kukai practice. They are all inseparable. Thus, Maitahu are committed to working with Soho properties, in QE2, so that the covenants ultimately reflect consistently our cultural interests in ongoing participation in the protection and maintenance of the biodiversity values on the stations. It seems to me that there is a tribe of whakatauti or proverb that reflects what this means to us, not only to us, but to New Zealanders as a whole. And that goes, Motata re kauri So that is, this is for our children and our children, the children who, for us and our children who follow a suitable whakatauti we think for this significant gesture. Uh, no area of the Tenama Koto, I will now close with a karaki that I think is uh, appropriate for this particular ceremonial occasion. To pia tahi a raki a raki a tiku te raki i ruka mai nei te amu mai e. Toto mai waho te tāriki o te rā hau hati ko ko rati kuehu. Nā wai te kura whakarere e e mūma e. Nā wai i toko toko te raki ko tāne ārake. Nā wai te kura whakarere ko e pamere. Kia ora tātou, kato.